everyone. Welcome to day 15 of 31 Days of Terror. We are almost halfway there. To kick things off today, I would like to thank our newest Patreon subscribers. I would like to thank Brenda Rafak, Amanda Slattery, Amy Robson, Gary N, Perry Biggerstaff, Lisa Cullis, Manuela Montenegro, Maggie Wallace, Lisa Brady, Ayanna Sagernick, Ayanna, I really promise if it's actually Lana, so Lana or Ayanna, I can't figure out which one it is. Francis McCarthy, Daniel M, Charlotte Jeffrey and Kelsey Guinness. Thank you so much for subscribing to the Patreon. You are so appreciated and I'm thankful for you every single day. And I have four listener stories for you today. And just to give you an update on where we are, the last story comes from the 1st of October 2020. Story number one comes from Izzy. My family and I have always been very in tune with spirits and I've had many one-on-one experiences but this one in particular shakes me to my core whenever I tell it. It was around late February, early March and my mom, my sister and I thought it would be a nice day to go on a hiking trail that we have always gone on with our new puppy Coco. So we got our things together and went to the mountain When we got there, we saw there was a few clumps of snow and patches of ice on the rocks. So just to be safe, my mom and my sister decided last minute to go on the snowmobile trail instead. From the moment I stepped on the trail, I had this sinking feeling. Like that feeling you get when you're in a haunted house and you know someone's around the corner about to scare you. I said I didn't want to go on the trail to my mom and she said not to worry about it, that it was okay. So still nervous, I continued, but tried to stay behind, and weirdly, so did my dog, who's usually very energetic. But at least I wasn't alone, so I couldn't complain. I mentioned a few more times to my mom and my sister that I was freaked out, and they kept shaking off what I was saying, until we came across these three rocks in a triangle-like formation, with red painted smiley faces on them and it gave everyone an odd, uninvited feeling that made us all very uncomfortable now. All of us were walking together, because we were weirded out, but we continued on. About three minutes later, I looked up and saw this old, rotted hunter's chair. But it had been there for so long that the tree bark was growing around it, so much that it looked like they had become part of each other but the feeling that I got when I looked at the chair was something that will live with me forever. My heart sank, and my stomach felt like a pit. It felt as if someone was staring at me bent over in that chair, with big wide eyes, and I couldn't look away as if I was in some sort of a trance. I forced myself to keep walking, but when I looked up, I saw my mom grab my sister's arm and squeeze it and they both looked at each other with the colour drained from their faces. My mom asked my sister, Did you just hear what I just heard? My sister replied, The whispers? Yeah, I heard them too. My mom ripped her keys from her pocket and gave them to my sister and told us both to run. We all started running probably faster than any of us had ever run before. And when we got to the car, we locked the doors and headed out of there as fast as we could. When I was able to catch my breath, I asked my mom and my sister exactly what they heard. And they said they had heard voices. But so many of them all overlapping each other. But not for a warning from good. But a warning from evil. I searched up the mountain online to see if by any chance there was any experiences like the one we had, but nothing came up. But I know that there was something evil in that woods that day, and none of us will forget it. I'm so glad my dad believes this because we bring it up so many times. Still to this day, I wonder why I never heard the voices, but I'm glad that I didn't. And story number two comes from Laura. I will start by saying that I wouldn't class myself as a full believer, but I'm also not fully dismissive of the paranormal. Unlike my husband, who is a science-only kind of guy. Basically, I am pro-ghost adventures portals to hell, however I draw the line at most haunted. Growing up, I remember the three golden rules. Don't lie. 
Don't say fuck. And do not fuck with a Ouija board. And let me tell you, I never fucked with a Ouija board. When I was seven years old, my mum, my elder brother and I moved to a house in a small town in Warwickshire called Kenilworth. My childhood was fairly normal for the typical 90s kid and I wouldn't say I was aware of anything odd or scary in that house. It just seemed normal. The house was an end of terrace three-bedroomed house and my room was the smaller of the three, which was to the front of the house. My brother and my mum had two double rooms at the back I used to sleep every single night with this yellow knitted blanket called Snuggly. A totally original name, I know, but hey, it was Snuggly. My mum had knitted me this blanket when I was a baby and it just became a favourite of mine throughout my childhood and was constantly getting repaired. I would sleep holding the blanket during the night and keep it under my pillow during the day. On a totally normal night, I woke up. It was definitely the early hours because everyone in the house was sound asleep. I opened my eyes, and in front of me, less than a foot from my face, someone was stood there staring at me. I could see a boy, perhaps a little older than me, but I couldn't be sure. I just remember staring at him, too scared to close my eyes. I was honestly frozen with fear. After what seemed like a lifetime, I finally managed to pull my blanket up over my eyes. I was shaking and too scared to scream out loud. The next day, I accused my brother of playing a trick on me, but he had absolutely no idea what I was talking about. And as much of a dickhead that he was, he was telling the truth. Perhaps a year or so went by with nothing. No weird feelings, no weird dreams, nothing. Then, just like the last time, I woke up in the early hours, opened my eyes and he was back. He was still just stood there staring at me. We locked eyes and I could remember shaking with fear. I could feel my blanket in my hands and I had to focus everything on pulling it up over my eyes as I had done previously. Eventually I did and I fell back to sleep. That was the last time I saw the boy. And even though it was over 20 years ago, I remember it like it was yesterday. Years later, I had a baby when I was in my late teens. And even though my mum had moved into another house, I rented that one from her. I made sure that my daughter didn't sleep in that room. And as far as I'm aware, nothing else happened. The only thing I will say about that house is that when I moved back in with my daughter, I always got an uneasy feeling in the master bedroom like someone was watching me. When I spoke to my mum about it, she said she had the same feeling every single day. A year ago, my husband and I bought our first home in Staffordshire, a beautiful brand new three-storey home which we live in with our two daughters and our new puppy Zero. About three months ago, some strange stuff happened and this is the part I need your help with. Early one morning at around 5am, my husband and I woke up to a bang, which sounded like my daughter's baby Annabelle doll falling off her bed and hitting the floor. Immediately after, we heard my daughter shout, Hey! Who hit me? We went into her bedroom to find her sound asleep with nothing on the floor to explain the big bang that we had just heard. When we asked her about it later on in the day, she said that someone had hit her, but she couldn't see them. A few weeks later I woke up in the early hours again because I could hear our puppy being sick and the sick hitting the floor just on the other side of our bedroom door. I sat upright, woke up my husband as I launched out of bed and swung the door open expecting to see Zero stood there. He was there, but he was sound asleep and there was no sick. But I heard it, I heard him wretch and I heard it hit the floor. I got back into bed and closed my eyes, thinking that it was just a dream. As soon as I did, I heard a really loud woman's scream and the sound of a glass smashing from next door. Almost as if someone was arguing and they had just thrown a glass in frustration. I woke my husband again, but there was just silence. No noise, no crying or shouting, or anything which you would expect to hear during an argument. 
I got back into bed again and closed my eyes, but this felt different. I felt like I was being watched. I lay there for a while with my eyes closed, trying to calm my thoughts down and make sense of them. I knew someone was watching me, and I knew they were at the foot of my bed. The idea of a sleep demon came to me pretty quickly, and I thought that if I opened my eyes and acknowledged him, then he would climb onto my chest and I would be paralysed. So I kept my eyes closed as tight as I could, and I made sure that I was holding onto my husband's arm tightly. When I woke up the next morning, the house was empty. My husband had gotten up early to take the dog for a long walk with my daughter as he usually does on the weekends. I got up, threw some comfy clothes on, and started gathering laundry to put the first wash of the day on. My husband and I sleep on the top floor and we have our own ensuite. On the middle floor, there are our two daughters' bedrooms and the family bathroom which they share. I walked down our set of stairs and opened the girls' bathroom door. It felt like when you step off a plane abroad and the heat just hits you. That was what it was like. I dropped the laundry in my arms and put my hand on the radiator. It was scalding hot. I ran upstairs to check the thermostat which controls the temperature for the top two floors and it was set to off. So I went downstairs to check the thermostat on the ground floor just in case that one controlled the radiators on the middle floor and that was also set to off. So I checked the boiler. It was set to hot water only and no radiators. I called my husband asking if he knew what was going on and he said that he woke up because he thought he heard the heating flick on but it was August, so he brushed it off as his mind playing tricks with him. At this point, I was considering burning the house down and saging the ashes, but I decided to pull my big girl pants on and carry on. If a ghost was haunting me, then it could start paying towards the fucking rent and the heating bill. Last week, something really odd happened. My 11-year-old daughter's room is directly above the living room, and at 5am... She woke to the sound of the Peppa Pig theme tune coming from the TV in the living room. Thinking that it was her seven-year-old sister sneakily watching cartoons, she made her way downstairs to catch her in the act. But as she opened the living room door, she found the room empty. The TV was on and playing Peppa Pig, but the room was dark and empty. She turned the TV off, closed the door and went upstairs to ask her sister why she would put the TV on and then sneak off but her sister was fast asleep. At 7.30am, when we were all awake, my daughter asked us what happened and why the TV was showing Peppa Pig. My husband is convinced that she was dreaming and sleepwalking, but she swears blind that it happened and I believe her. A few days later, she was in bed, watching Netflix on her tablet, and she saw a shadow figure walking from her window across her bedroom and straight through her door. Personally, I'm not sure how she did not scream, vomit, cry, and then burn the house down, but when I asked her, she said she just didn't feel scared. I do feel as though I should mention that in my bedroom, by the bottom of my bed, there is a vintage dressing table and mirror, which is 130 years old, that I restored. In my garage, there is another vintage chest of drawers, and a mirror from the same year, and on my staircase, there is a vintage mirror that I recently picked up from a house clearance. I've always loved old furniture and mirrors. However, now I'm considering the idea that maybe one of the many people who have looked into these mirrors across the years could be trapped inside. That. Or I'm actually losing the plot. On a side note, why on earth did they make a global brand of baby dolls named Baby Annabelle? It's too creepy. Have they not heard the stories? And story number three comes from Anonymous. Up until recently, I was working out of an 80-year-old firehouse. We got a new building just a few feet behind the old one because the old one was falling apart. We were regularly forced to play shit roulette, which was basically a plumbing issue, and any time we flushed a toilet one toilet in the firehouse would start spraying water out pretty aggressively, meaning you had to flush and sprint away in case that toilet happened to be the one you were using. Because, you know, it's not too fun spending the day covered in your urine or shit. 
We had extreme budget constraints with constructing the new building because we live in a poor area. So we had to participate in whatever we could do to build the new firehouse. In the spot, the new firehouse that currently sits in, we used to have a small building we referred to as the shed. It wasn't really a shed, it was more of a two-bay garage, but that was what we called it. We used it for storage and training mostly. Occasionally, we would find items in there that nobody knew where they came from, but nothing crazy. When the shed was knocked down to start building the foundation for the new firehouse, we found a basement that nobody knew existed. There was no access point to it, but it was clear that it was at some point occupied. Of the few things we found in there, there was a wool blanket and a bottle of whiskey from the late 1800s. Our fire department is only 80 years old, so it certainly has nothing to do with us. We did some research and found no record of any building ever existing on the land besides our firehouse, so I don't think we'll ever figure it out. And again, if we had never knocked that building down, we would never have known about it because there was no access point or any indication of it existing. We threw out everything we found in the dumpster and forgot about it for a while. The firehouse took three years to complete, so us throwing these things out was over three years ago. We've been working out of our new building for a few months now, and we did wonder if the ghosts would follow us to the new building, and for a while it seemed like they didn't. However... Some of my fellow firefighters decided to play with a Ouija board one night a few weeks ago and asked about the firehouse. When I found out, I told them I was going to kick their asses if they dragged some creepy shit into the new building. Well, last week shit got weird. I went to the firehouse to get my wallet. I forgot it on my gear rack. When I went inside, I heard somebody walking and a low male voice. I didn't think anything of it because the floor plan is a closed concept and it's easy to hear but not see somebody. But I never found anybody after looking for a while. Then I walked past a couch that is sitting up against the back wall behind our trucks and I saw the whiskey bottle that we threw away three years ago on the couch. Somehow I didn't shit myself and my dumbass ran back to my gear rack instead of outside to my car. I jumped on top of my gear rack, knocking over several people's helmets in the process, and stared towards the couch, trying to figure out what the fuck was going on as I took my knife out of my pocket and held it in the air as if I was somehow intimidating somebody. At this point, my lieutenant happened to walk in, and I instantly started screaming at the top of my lungs before I saw who it was. Of course, his immediate reaction was to ask, why the fuck I was planking on top of the gear rack, holding my knife in the air screaming. Apparently I felt safer with him being there and I suddenly started being less of a wimp and jumped off the gear rack to show him what the hell was freaking me out so much. In the process of jumping off the gear rack, I knocked over more stuff, including my deodorant, a stash of condoms my friend had for some reason, a jar of butt paste I have because of my GI issues and my tampons. My jar of butt paste hit the floor a second before my feet and I ended up crushing it even more. So now my shoe was covered in butt paste as my lieutenant was staring at me. I walked over to the couch to show him the whiskey bottle to which his reaction was for him to take his knife out and put his hand on his gun. We searched the entire building and nobody was there. And again, we threw this whiskey bottle away three years ago and it was definitely the same exact bottle. As we were making a lap around the first floor searching everywhere for a living person who was fucking with us, my captain walked in and scared the crap out of us and my lieutenant started screaming threats at him very aggressively. Not having ever heard him scream like that, my captain slowly turned the corner with his gun drawn. Both of them quickly put their guns away, thank God, and we filled in our captain about the situation. So after realising that a living person wasn't the cause of the incident, we decided to take the bottle of whiskey and drive it into the woods on the north side of town about three miles from the firehouse and throw it into the woods. We figure that weird shit happens there all the time so they won't know any different. We got back to the firehouse and we spent an hour cleaning up butt paste that I had tracked all around the building. My officers were nice enough to give me a hand cleaning it up. We had an interesting meeting the following month. 
Some key points being that firefighters are no longer allowed to play with Ouija boards, which is a weird rule to need. And if you keep things like condoms and butt paste at the firehouse, then you need to keep it in your locker, not on top of your gear rack, you know, in case one of your fellow firefighters needs to plank on top of it for safety. There are also a lot of security cameras in the firehouse, since the old building had stuff stolen from it a lot. So that entire incident was on tape. Yeah, so my chiefs thought it would be a good morale boost to show everyone me planking on top of the gear rack and knocking off a bunch of condoms and butthole paste while jumping down, followed by my lieutenant and captain almost pointing their guns at each other while I held a knife in the air. One of my chiefs apparently can see security footage on his laptop and he was watching the whole incident unfold at home. His wife thought he was having an asthma attack or something because he was laughing so hard he couldn't breathe. That is both the best and the worst thing to ever happen to me in the firehouse. Good times. I hope you enjoy laughing at me and my fellow firefighters. And story number four comes from Rhiannon. I've always had a fascination with the paranormal. And this is also not our first haunted encounter. But that is a story for another time. My husband and I moved into a duplex after he returned from deployment to Iraq. We felt it was the time to get out of the city and we selected a nice neighbourhood in the small town of Gardner, Kansas. The duplexes were fairly new, maybe five years old when we moved in. Almost immediately we began to suspect that something was wrong. Feeling that you were being watched and you would hear cupboards in the kitchen shutting and vibrating like someone was hitting them. After a while, we noticed that cupboards would open or close while we were gone. My husband and I both saw shadows on the walls that should not have been possible to create. And we both had experiences of feelings of uneasiness or even dread occasionally. My husband was still in the National Guard and would often be gone for the weekend or even a couple of weeks at the time for drill. When he was gone, the house seemed even more active. I would be sitting on the couch watching TV and I would hear him call my name and then quickly realise that he was not at home. He and our daughter would also experience the same phenomenon, hearing my voice calling them when I was in another part of the house or not home. Unfortunately, we did not have the resources to move and we could not break our lease. Our daughter, who was around seven when we moved in, had a bedroom on the lower level. Before moving it to this duplex, she would sleep on her own in her room with no problem. Upon moving to the duplex, she refused to sleep in her room and was having accidents at night. Eventually, when we did get her to sleep downstairs, she would close the door and leave her light on. She later told me that she would see shadows moving in the hallway at night time. One night when I was pregnant and up late watching TV, my husband was away at drill. I heard the door handle on my bedroom door shake violently. I was convinced that someone had gotten into the house and I quickly grabbed a knife and went upstairs to check. Of course, there was nobody there. Frequently I would see shadows moving around our bedroom at night, especially if I was alone. Another time I was taking a shower. Our kids were both in bed and my husband was in the computer room in the basement two and a half floors down. The lights in the bathroom shut off. I stuck my head out and noticed that the hall light was still on and the bathroom switch had been shut off. I yelled at my husband thinking he was messing with me, but no response and the lights flipped back on by themselves. Needless to say, I finished that shower very quickly and was freaked out to be alone in the house. After several months, a new couple moved into the duplex attached to ours. We quickly became friends. They asked if we had ever experienced anything strange in the house. We told them about our experiences, and they were experiencing the same things in their duplex. Eventually, we purchased four night vision cameras and installed them, We installed two upstairs in the living room, dining room area and one downstairs in the hallway. We would regularly see a slow moving, flashing orb in the living room. They were only visible when the night vision mode was on. But our son, who was born a little over a year after we moved in, seemed to be able to see them in person. He would sometimes laugh and chase when left alone in the living room. You could also hear movement and occasionally even faint voices over the audio feed when no one was in the area. My husband began to use his cell phone to try and document these occurrences. 
He took over 200 videos without catching much more than the occasional orb. Until the early evening of April the 19th, 2013. My husband was hanging out with our son while I was at my mom's house working on a memorial video for my grandfather who had passed away a couple of days before. He began to notice a noise coming from the kitchen behind him. There was a lot of clutter on the table and it sounded like someone was moving the leftover cardboard from a pizza. He began recording, documenting that our dog Bella was not in the immediate area and our son was in the living room with him watching TV. He explained what he was hearing and was panning around hoping to see what was causing the noise. What he caught shook him to the core. We had purchased a wind chime during a recent trip to Amish country, the old-timey kind that was handmade from silverware. The crafter used a fork to suspend other pieces of cutlery from fishing line. Very rural, kitschy knick-knack. It was hanging in the dining room near the windows, almost directly in front of where I was standing. The chimes were spinning. He immediately stopped recording, grabbed our son and left the house. He pulled into a parking lot and watched the video over and over for at least half an hour. He called me from a parking lot down the street from our home. He refused to return to the house until I came back. The chime spun along the centre of its axis, not swaying much at all, like something had intentionally spun the chime to get his attention. Personally, I think it was my grandpa visiting my son who he was really close to. We've shown the video to a lot of different kinds of people. Skeptics and believers alike agree that there is nothing visible that appears to move them, but no one has ever been able to find a reason for them to move like this. But you judge for yourself after you watch the video. About four years ago we were finally able to buy a house a few blocks away, and we have not had any unexplained activity since. Don't put wind chimes in your house. So like always, the video that accompanies this story is on the Facebook page, it is on the Instagram page, and it will also be on Patreon. And I must say, it's a very interesting one. When I first read the story, I thought it would just be the chimes like jingling a little bit, but it really isn't. So I strongly recommend that you check it out. Thank you to Izzy, Laura, Anonymous and Rhiannon for sending in your stories. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. And if you would like to send in your own spooky story, you can do so by sending it to real life ghost stories podcast at gmail.com. You can also check out our website, real life ghost stories podcast.com. And on that note, we shall see you tomorrow. Discover South Carolina presents The Palmetto Porch, a podcast featuring some of the most uniquely charming destinations across the Palmetto State. I'm Devin Whitmire. Join me as I find out what's off the beaten path as I speak to South Carolina locals who know their towns best. Find The Palmetto Porch wherever you get your podcasts. And for more information about our show, visit scpalmettoporch.com.